Will you turn with me to Revelation chapter 13? Revelation chapter 13. I don't know if any of you have noticed these lovely flowers, but they look great, don't they? Especially with spring on the way. So we can thank Cheryl for those. They look lovely. Revelation chapter 13, reading from verse 1. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns, and each head had a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and the mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. They also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Let's come to pray. <clears throat> Gracious and eternal God, we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful privilege of being able to gather together this morning, Lord, to study your word. We ask and pray, Lord, that you speak into our hearts again by your Holy Spirit that your Holy Spirit moves very powerfully up and down the aisle and amongst the pews, touching our hearts, opening our eyes, and Lord, helping us to be aware of world events as we're living, and Lord, to move forward to the glory of your name alone. Lord, we commit all things to you this morning. Lord, may your Holy Spirit touch us, and may you be glorified. For Jesus' sake, and God's people say, Amen. Amen. <coughs> I've entitled today's study, The Rise of the Beast. The rise of the beast. Revelation 19, 19, John writes, Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war. Biblical prophecies clearly indicate for us that rise of an antichrist, the rise of a world leader in the end times, a man who is going to be in every way against God. In fact, many today believe that it has already begun. All a civilization speeds forward to its destiny. The appearance of a powerful world leader is something that is absolutely inevitable. The ultimate question facing us in our own generation today, with all its increasing crime, with all its corruption, with its wicked and weak governments, its increasing drug abuse worldwide, increasing godlessness, increasing war in the Middle East, and threats of war across the world, its vast climatic changes that we are witnessing, and tremendous economic hardships, is whether this man is already alive and well and moving into power somewhere in the world in which we are living today. And so how can we know as a group of people today who he is? What clues are there for you and I concerning this man's identity? When, we, when will he make his move? When will he stand up and reveal himself? When will he move forward and seek to control the global world and its politics? Well, the Bible predicts that there will be worldwide chaos in instability economically, hardship, crime, disorder, lawlessness, and war will be increasing when he comes to the forefront as we approach the end of the age. In fact, our Lord Jesus predicted such. He said in Matthew 24, verse 6 and 7, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. 
Dr. Ed Dobson observes, the Bible also predicts that this chaos will pave the way for the rise of a new world leader who will be able to negotiate world peace and deliver on the promises of security and harmony. This world leader is a person whom Bible students call Antichrist. Now, if we look at world history today, there have always been many people, political leaders, religious leaders, business leaders, whom we could call today antichrists. Even in the days of the Apostle John, he turned to use the word singular antichrists, and other times he used the plural many antichrists. In fact, said the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, he said, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist singular has coming. Even now many Antichrists have come. And he went on to define the, the, these lesser Antichrists as simply liars uh, who deny that Jesus Christ is in fact the Son of the living God in 1 John 2.22. And so in this sense, an antichrist is any false teacher, any person who denies who Jesus is, who stands up and denies what Jesus Christ went and did upon the cross for the sins and the redemption of man. Such a man is truly anti-opposed to Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, John warns us as Christians to stand up and to test the spirits to make sure that they actually are from God. In that you see, every single person who speaks, speaks on behalf of a spirit. As I stand before you this morning, I speak on behalf of a spirit. Either they speak indwelt by the spirit of Jesus Christ, the person, or they speak on behalf of a spirit that is outside of Jesus Christ. You need to be very careful whom you listen to. Don't get caught up with Bible degrees and reverence and doctors and bishops and titles. And so in 1 John chapter 4 verse 1, John warns us that false prophets have literally gone out into the world. They are there, many. And he says, 1 John 4 verse 2 and 3, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. And so in, these, in this sense, John announces the spirit of the Antichrist. As you sit back this morning as a Christian and you look at our world, he is already in the world. That spirit of antiness is already there. And certainly there are many, many people right now who we know or who you bump into in daily life who are opposed and, and not in favor of Jesus Christ, aren't they? There's many people that are not in favor of Jesus. In fact, if you bring up Jesus uh, and, and what Jesus Christ went and done, uh, went and did, uh, there is an argument. I'm sure every single one of us know people like that. You can sit back and discuss world events. You can sit back and discuss other religions. You can sit back and discuss other gods. And there's not an issue. But the moment you bring up Jesus Christ and you bring up the Word of God and you speak of what God requires and you speak about Scripture, there's an uncomfortable atmosphere and people become hostile and aggressive. We all know people like that. We have all bumped into people like that. But says the Word of God, there is coming an ultimate antichrist who is coming. A man who is so evil, so opposed in life to the things of Almighty God, so dangerous, so feared in life, that he is a man who will influence the world so much so that God repeatedly in the Old and the New Testament turns and warns you and I as his people against him. And the world is looking for such a man. As I turned and quoted to you last week, the former Prime Minister of Belgium is one who as he stood and he looked around the world uh, at that time. He turned and addressed the EU Parliament and the, and the United Nations and he turned and he said this, We do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass in which we are sinking. 
Send us such a man, be he God or the devil, and we will receive him. Wow. Now, over the last couple of weeks, we have turned and we have looked as God's people at two major questions about this world leader. And the first question was this. Where will this man come from? Where will he come from? Or what is his ancestry? His ancestry. And in answer to this, we saw in Revelation 13, 1, that this man doesn't just appear suddenly on the world scene. It's not that he just suddenly walks in and, and there's a strange individual with a bad temper. But in the allowing hand of God, he is literally, Revelation 13, 1, summoned forth by Satan the dragon from out of the people and the nations of the world. He's summoned out of the sea. He's summoned out of the abyss. The sea and the abyss are used interchangeably in the Greek and in Scripture. Meaning that he is in every single way a man of flesh and blood, just like you and I are. He comes from the world. He rises out of the sea. He rises out of the nations of the world. And that the nations of the world are never ever peaceful. But they're always tossing backwards and forth. There's always issues in the world's nations, just like the ocean. It's never calm. It's never peaceful. And such will be the world of this Antichrist. The world in which this man literally arises from. A world that will be very unsettled at the time of his appearing on the world scene. Don't think he's going to arise out of a peaceful environment. He's going to arise out of a difficult time. There will be protests. There will be marches across the world. There will be issues in nations and countries. Lawlessness is literally going to be increasing across the world. Economic hardships for many nations and people and groups. There will be war and discussions of war and rumors of war and threats of war across the world. Discontentment is literally going to be raising its head across the globe. And there will be war, says the Bible, in the Middle East. And this man will then suddenly appear at that time. But not only from the sea and the nations and the peoples of the world, but from the sea of the abyss, says the Bible. What a picture! The abyss, an angelic prison, created by God for the most evil of spirits in the entire universe. The most wicked, evil, angelic spirits uh, in the world. In other words, not only is he summoned, Revelation chapter 13 verse 1, from the world, literally by the devil, summoned and brought out. But he is going to be a man so evil, so wicked, so ghastly. That in spirit and literally in character, it's going to be as though he has been released from one of the most evil demonic prisons ever created by God in the entire universe, the abyss. In fact, in Revelation 13, 1, he will be a man who in every way pictures Satan, his father. As it says of him in Revelation 13, verse 1, he had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns. In Revelation 12, verse 3, it says of the devil, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon, Satan, with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns on his heads. That's a family resemblance, wouldn't you agree? He is as evil, literally, as his father, the devil. Having the same dreams and the same hopes and the same goals and the same desires as Satan himself. You and I as God's people, as we pick up the newspaper and live in the world in which we live and look at world events, we need to be aware, every single one of us. Now this man has ten horns. Now a horn always symbolizes power, it symbolizes strength, it symbolizes might. As we have said, just got, got to look at an animal with its horns in the, as the head of its own uh, grouping. Meaning that this man is either part of a strong world ten leader confederacy, or he rises up and joins ten world leaders. And it doesn't take us much to think of America and Britain and various leaders in the world. 
Later, according to Daniel chapter 7, 24, he removes three of those world leaders and takes their place and their voice. He also has seven heads, meaning that he is the final of seven world kingdoms that God has ordained to literally govern and rule over the world in which we live. There are seven world kingdoms through history. He is the final dictator. There will be no more dictator after this man. We then moved on secondly to look at his authority. His authority. In that what is the authority of the Antichrist? Well, as we saw in Revelation 13 too, his power is there and it's going to resemble a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Remember? Leopard, bear, and lion. Now what does that mean? Why does God turn around and describe this man and his rule with the power that is referring to animals? Well, God does so because the character of the animals represents how this man is literally, in, in, in truth, going to uh, govern the nations of the world. And we did a study last week into Daniel chapter 7 and how this has worked out. And God says he will have the character, firstly, of a leopard. A leopard. What is a leopard like? Well, it hides. If you've ever been out in the bush, you will know that a leopard will sit up in the trees. Don't look for him on the ground necessarily. He might be above, above your own head. He's swift. He's strong. He's agile. He's cunning as an animal. He's also a bear. What's a bear like? Well, a bear is an animal with terrible paws. It's able to tear and to crush its prey. It's violent. It's extremely aggressive. It's dangerous. And it's unpredictable. You've only got to read the writings, because we don't have them here, but you've got to read the writings about those that have dealt with them. They're extremely volatile. They're extremely dangerous. But he's also a lion. What is a lion like? Well, a lion is loud. You know it's there. It grunts. It roars. It's always making threats, as it were, in the animal kingdom. It prowls around for its prey. It's cunning. It's fearful. It's powerful. It's fast. And so God is one who turns around and He gives us these descriptions so that we as a group of people here this morning can literally understand what He will be like in His own rule and governance. All as Satan himself surrounds this man and gives this man his power. He's going to be totally satanic in all he does. And so says God. This man is going to be a leader in our world like no man has ever been a leader in world history before. He's going to be cunning. At times, uh, he's going to be controlling. He's going to be in the background of things all the time, shuffling around in the background. Not necessarily the face, but his power and his influence is there, just like a leopard, hiding away. He will be swift to deal with world issues. Things won't get on top of this man. Militarily and politically, he will be strong and he will be extremely agile. In fact, he's going to be so strong and fierce politically and militarily, he will tear and crush violently and aggressively anyone who stands in his path. As a leader, he will be dangerous. He will be extremely unpredictable, just like a bear. And as a lion, he will be loud, he will be boastful, you will know he's around. He will be an incredible public speaker, an incredible orator, always making threats and controlling the world by fear and power and militarism. Nice guy. Nice guy. Who, who's excited to meet him? I don't hear any amens this morning. But he's coming. You say, is all this actually possible, Mark? Is it possible in the world in which we live? Yes. If God turns around and says something in Scripture, the Lord's only got to say it once for it to be true. It's coming. And you only have to sit back this morning on a practical level and sit and think about the United States, for example. Their president turns and speaks and the whole world literally hears about it. If he makes international policy from the White House, the whole world is literally affected by it. When he walks into a room, the other world leaders stand to greet him. If he has an issue with another country, he can literally impose worldwide sanctions on that nation. And if a country will not comply, he will put pressure on them. 
And if necessary, he can send his military across the world at a moment's notice to deal with any offending nation. And no one can take their stand against the United States and win. Well, that will be this leader. The only difference is he is going to literally have Satan's power behind him. He's going to be a man who will be literally unaccountable for a period of time before God until the end. Now, we've studied this in a lot of detail last week, and so I do encourage you to re-listen to that message, which will be posted later today. But we need to have this picture in our own minds and in our own souls. Let's turn now and look finally at his acclaim. His acclaim. Look at Revelation 13, verse 3. John writes, One of the heads of the beast, Antichrist, seemed to have a fatal wound. Fatal. But the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was what astonished and followed the beast. Question. How will this man, this boastful, evil dictator, become God to the world? How is he going to rise up and become God in people's minds? How will this man get so much political power in the last three and a half years of world history that he will literally govern the hearts and the minds of the politicians and the people around him? How he will he win this world for Satan? Well, if you look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, you will see with me that these things are going to happen. Winning the world for Satan, because the world is going to be amazed, verse 3, astonished at him. Do you see that? The world is going to be utterly astonished at this man. Why? Well, it seems that the world's astonishment literally lies in the fact that one of the heads of this beast seems to literally have had a fatal, a fatal wound that was suddenly healed. Now what does that mean for you and I? Well the word fatal there is the very same Greek word used in Revelation 5 verse 6 in description of Jesus Christ. John turns and he writes in Revelation 5 6, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been what? Slain. Slain. Now the lamb there is, is our Lord Jesus. And in Revelation 5, 6, it's a reference to Jesus Christ's death upon the cross. In that Jesus, our Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, was slain, slain, killed, murdered. He died for our sins. The cross, humanly speaking, was absolutely fatal to Jesus Christ. Now what this means in terms of the Antichrist here, is that his head... His thought processes, that which guides this world leader in the governance of the leaders and the nations of the world around him, the other heads, is going to bear the evidence of a mortal, fatal wound upon him. A scar that is literally going to turn around and indicate that he had been slain, he had been murdered, just like Jesus Christ. And it's going to be something that's very evident, murder. There's going to be a massive scar to all those who turn and they will look upon him. His death is something that would have been literally public. It's going to have to be a world event. All are going to see it. All are going to know about it. All in life are going to sit back and acknowledge it. Look down at verse 12, Revelation 13, middle of the verse. It says of this Antichrist's right-hand man, known as the false prophet, and God willing, we will deal with him sometime later. It says, he made the earth, what? And its inhabitants worship, who? The, most, the, the first beast, Antichrist, whose fatal wound had been, what? Healed. Wow. There it is. There it is. The commentary on what is going on here. It is a fatal wound. He bears the same Greek word that is used to describe what happened to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in his murder and in his death upon the cross. And it is now used of the Antichrist himself as well. This is Satan's copycat to Jesus Christ. So that the, the term head here, it is not speaking of a nation, it is him. 
It is his own head. It is his head that was literally struck. And the whole world turns and sits back and looks at him. His head, his mind, that which directs his thoughts on a daily level, that which governs the world, his life. The wound on his head is that which killed him. And now it has been healed. Look at Revelation 13, 14, middle of the verse. It says, He, that's the Antichrist's right-hand man, the false prophet, ordered them, that's the peoples and the nations of the world, to set up an image in honor of the beast, Antichrist, who was wounded by the sword and yet, what? Lived. He was murdered. He resurrected. He was healed. And a man who was dead now lives. This is all telling us very clearly that the Antichrist will be one in the course of the tribulation, in the course of his governance, who will be assassinated. Somebody is going to assassinate this man. Revelation 13, 14, he was wounded fatally by the sword. A sword, a literal weapon. Somebody goes for him. He's murdered on the world scene. Think recently of how Donald Trump was nearly killed. Somebody murders him. Initially, when he comes to power, he is not spoken of as having a wound. He is seen rather as a man who brings world peace. Revelation chapter 6, it says that he appears on a white horse with a bow, with no arrows. In other words, he comes as a, as a consummate diplomat. He comes to bring diplomacy to the world scene, particularly to the Middle East. And then he receives later a mortal wound in the tribulation. And the world sees it. It's fatal. Doctors can do absolutely nothing for this man. He dies. There's nothing that can be done. The world sits back in absolute shock. Revelation 13, 12, it says of him, the first beast whose what? Fatal wound had been healed. It's fatal. Revelation 13, 14, it says they set up an image in honor of the beast Antichrist who was wounded by the sword and yet he lived. Wow. It was fatal, but he resurrected just like Jesus Christ and he lived and the world sees it and the world acknowledges it. Think of television. Think of YouTube. It's assassination. It literally goes absolutely viral. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's watching this world leader and they're utterly amazed. Because he lives. Now perhaps at this point, he has, comes back totally possessed in resurrection by Satan. Maybe he's one who has the same moves, he breathes, he acts, he has the same mannerisms that he's always had in daily life. But this time he is empowered by Satan and indwelt by him. It's certainly possible. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9, it states that the Antichrist will literally win the world over because of the miraculous that is going to surround his coming, the lying wonders. Don't think it's going to be a peaceful, sedate world. The world will be in topsy-turvy, but the world is going to see miracles on a scale we have never known before. In fact, let me read to you 2 Thessalonians 2 9. It says that the coming of Antichrist the lawless one, or Antichrist, will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, in every sort of evil that deceives those that are perishing. They will perish because they refuse to love the truth of Jesus and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them, what? A powerful delusion, a powerful lie, so that they, the world, will believe the lie, so that all will be condemned to have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. Wow. And so literally around this person of the Antichrist will be the miraculous. It will bring him worldwide acclaim. The whole world is going to watch this world leader. They're going to be amazed and fascinated literally by him. And immediately he will become a god to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, it says, He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he literally sets himself up in God's temple and proclaims himself to be God. Wow. 
Now, to the best of our understanding, we believe that this is something that happens three and a half years into the seven-year peace agreement he signs with Israel in the Middle East. He is assassinated. He resurrects on national television. Imagine the scene. It's a day of mourning. It's a public holiday. The world sits and watches and glued to their television and their phones, their computers. The soldiers are on parade. The flags are flying at half-mast. The men are in military precision. Their uniforms are shiny. The world is represented there. World leaders file past his coffin, paying their respects. The commentator and the news broadcasts are coming across in a sort of dirge way. And suddenly this man sits up in the coffin and he is alive. Later he goes to Israel, he flies in on his Air Force One and he walks into the newly built Jewish temple in Jerusalem and he proclaims himself to be God. And then this starts the mark of the beast, as we call it, on one's right hand and forehead to, to show their people's loyalty and their support to the new world leader who was resurrected. Persecution breaks out against the Christian church and against Israel. According to Revelation chapter 7, it is people of every nation, every people, every tribe, every language that will be persecuted. Millions literally die. The Bible says in Revelation 7, you cannot even count them. It's like the sand of the seashore. He is a stern-faced man. He is brilliant, an incredible public speaker. He's going to be charming. He's going to be headstrong, full of intrigue and outstanding politically. An economic master in life, playing one side against another side. A military genius and utterly, utterly evil. And people are going to sit back and they're going to be so amazed at his resurrection, so amazed at his abilities, that God literally sends them a powerful delusion in Thessalonians that is going to literally grip the world's mind and heart. Paul describes something of that following in 2 Thessalonians 2.10, that they the world follow after him because they receive not the love of the truth Jesus Christ that they might be saved. It's frightening, isn't it? And particularly because it, is, because it is in time going to happen. This is all going to happen. And with the events around us in our world right now at the moment, it may well happen in our lifetime. Who can say? The Bible says there's going to be a war in the book of Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. And Turkey will be involved and Turkey's wading into the issues. Iran is threatening revenge. Who's to say? And with events around us, it may well happen. Can I encourage you this morning to get to know God's Word better? Because God's Word, the Bible, contains everything that we need to know. Everything that we need to know for the future. To know that our loved ones can be saved and how they can come to salvation. This book, this book is God's life. To all of us. The word that it contains is exciting. It's powerful. It's dynamic. You can study God's word every single day for an absolute lifetime and never ever fathom the bottom of it. It's something that will grip your heart and literally fill you with passion the more you study it. It will change your life. It will reach deep down into your own soul and it will increase your faith as you read and study about the God who created all things and you read about the awesomeness and the love of that God. And in a world of lies, the word of God is that which contains and will protect your mind, it will protect your soul, it will protect your decisions. Read the word. And so we've seen his ancestry, his authority, his acclaim. Would you believe it? There's another A here. His adoration. His adoration. Revelation 13 verse 4. In that the world's fascination with him turns to worship, as I mentioned to you. Now you know it's one thing for every person to rise up in the world and to follow this man. 
It's something else to turn around and to assign some world leader deity. It's something else to turn around and say, this man's not just man, this man is God. In Revelation 13, 4, it says, Men, what? Worship the dragon Satan, because he had given authority to the beast Antichrist. They also worshipped the beast Antichrist and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Yes, fascination amongst our friends and our family and people around us and at the club turns the world into satanic worship. Satanic worship. In fact, as I pointed out to you, it says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, it says that the Antichrist is literally going to take his seat in the temple of God in Jerusalem and call himself on national television God and the world will believe it. No one else is resurrected in their view. In fact, he will be con not be content to acclaim he wants adoration. Not just acclaim, but adoration. He will not be content with the world's respect. He wants reverence. He's not content to be hailed and heralded. He wants to be worshipped. And so in Revelation 13, 4, in terms of the recklessness and the godlessness of the world that's around you and I, it says, men worship what? The dragon. Because he had given authority to the beast. And they also what? Worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The world is literally going to worship this man. In effect, it's going to be saying, we worship Satan through this man. The sad thing is, is that it happens and appears that the hearts of people in sin are just going to blindly rise up and walk after him. And when you stand up as a Christian here and you try to talk to your family and to your friends and to the people at the sports club about it, they will turn around and they will say to you, look, this man rose again from the dead. You saw it with your own eyes on national television. This isn't something rumored 2,000 years ago. We saw this man arise from the dead. This guy has got to be God. And besides, look at what he's gone and done on the political scene. He's unified the world. For the first time, there is peace in the Middle East. This guy has to be God. Don't you come to us with your Christian nonsense. You'll say, but listen, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Word of God tells us that He came into the world out of God's love and He died for the sins of those who turn and call upon Him by faith and repentance. And they will turn around to you and say, this is Jesus Christ. He has saved the world. And just notice what the world will say to show their complete and total devotion to the beast. Revelation 13 verse 4, they will say at the end of the verse, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Mm. Now what is the significance of such a statement as that? Well listen to these verses and you will know. In Exodus 15 11, Israel sang to God and said, Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, and working wonders? Who is like God? Wow. Listen to Psalm 35 verse 10. King David cries out, My whole being will exclaim, Who is like you, O Lord? Who is like you? Listen to Isaiah 40 verse 18. The prophet turns and says, To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare Him to? In Isaiah 40 verse 25, God says, To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? To whom will you compare me? Now those are just a few verses. But to show you that in daily life, the Scriptures always say, Who is like you, O God? Who is like you? And in the days of the Antichrist, you will hear the mocking language of the world turning around and saying in Revelation 13 verse 4, 
Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Basically what the world is saying is you are our God. You take the place of God. That's how evil the world will be at that time. And it may well be very short in the next two years, three years of our own lives. And so we see this beast's ancestry, his authority, his acclaim, his adoration. There's more to come. But that's next week. But now can I encourage you this morning to firstly build your relationship with God. To build your relationship. Read God's word every day. For it's in reading the word of God that you increase your faith in Jesus Christ. As you read the most wonderful and incredible stories ever penned. That you get to know the character of God better. And that will increase your prayer life. That you get to build a relationship with God personally by getting to know His character, to approach Him and to pray to the God of heaven and eternity. Somebody once defined the word Bible this way. They said Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Now it's more than that. But get to know your Bible. Because a time may well be coming where we will be running. We will be hiding. And all we will have to sustain us is the word of God that's been inscribed in our hearts and our minds by the Holy Spirit. Secondly, if you are somebody here this morning who in your own heart you know that you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Saviour, in that you are somebody who desires to go to heaven. But if God called now, you're not sure that you would literally be welcomed into the gates of paradise. You're a little bit unsure and it scares you to your soul. Then get right with God today. For when this satanic man comes on the world scene, you are going to need the Lord to stand true in a world of absolute chaos. For it's going to be a time in world history like no other time we've ever known before. Perhaps you would like to pray this prayer after me. Calling upon Jesus to be one saviour. After all, one needs to start seeking Christ. And in doing so, reading his word every day. If I can encourage you to read the Gospel of Mark. It's an incredible book. Let's pray. Perhaps as a Christian you might like to pray the prayer as a prayer of recommitment to the Lord. But quietly in your heart. Heavenly Father, you are the living God. There is no God or heaven and earth but you. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I come before you today and I repent of my sins. I know that I've allowed other things to come into my life. Some good and some bad. That have pulled me away from you. I repent of it Lord. Father I will seek to read your word every day. I'll seek to make that commitment that discipline. I'll seek to live a life, Lord Jesus, where I honour you. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name to forgive me, to wipe my slate clean, to fill me with your Holy Spirit, and to help me to walk a new and godly life starting right now, today. And when I fail, Lord, and I repent, will you lift me up and help me to persevere and never give up for Jesus? In Jesus' name I ask all this. And God's people say in Jesus, Amen. Amen.